seek in all things to follow the teaching and example of Jesus. We do what we do as a community of faith because we hope by God's grace to love God, others, and ourselves as Jesus calls us to love. As we grow in God's grace and help build the beloved community, we offer abundant hospitality to everyone. Recognize and honor the image of God in every human being, celebrating, not eradicating differences. Blend faith and action, generating a commitment to fighting injustice. Rely on scripture reading, prayer, and worship for inner strength. We invite you to look online to find out more about us and the ways we are putting faith into action in Billings and beyond. We hope that you'll enjoy this worship as much as we do. Welcome to Grace. We look forward to hearing your story and we're so glad you're here. Good morning. Welcome to church. I'm Sarah Clark, the pastor here at Grace. I'm so glad that you were joining us for worship today. I'm actually here live with you. And so um, I invite you to interact with me during the worship service. You can um, type comments into the chat. Uh, or if you'd like, you can... Um, send us a prayer request or a praise either in the chat or you can text them to me at 406-647-0383. We'll be sharing joys and concerns um, and prayers and praises later in the worship service. So please uh, share them with me so that we can be in prayer uh, together this week. As we um, worship this morning, I encourage you to find a way to, um, to make sacred space for our time together. Uh, open the blinds um, or curl up in a blanket or pour uh, another cup of coffee. I have my coffee here. Um, anything that makes you feel like this is sacred space and time that's set apart for us um, to be with God and to be with each other. This week we are continuing um, the series that we started last week, which is called Our Money Story. The idea of this series is that all of us have a money story, whether we recognize it or not. And during these um, few weeks of worship, as we focus on our money stories, we are going to be kind of pulling them apart, reflecting on our stories and also reflecting on God's story and how our story fits into God's narrative of liberation and justice and hope. This week we are focusing on the spiritual practice of release. Release is the unburdening of, of the things that hold us and keep us from God's love. Things like shame and anxiety and fear and greed and guilt. So as we begin our time of worship, as we remember that our God is a God of liberation and freedom and release, let us pray together. Holy God, through Moses you said, let my people go. In scripture, your law declares that in the seventh year you must cancel all debts. With grace, Jesus said, give one coat away. With honesty, Jesus said, sell what you have and give the money to the poor. You have always called and compelled us to let go, to release, to set free, to drop our nets, to give to others, to follow. So in this time of worship, May we release that which binds us. May we worship with open, untamed, and porous hearts, 
so that we can walk freely with you. Amen. Welcome to worship. I'm so glad you're here. I want to practice being free. I want to unstitch my heart from the edge of my sleeve so that I can give it a life of its own, a real chance to love and be known. I want to practice opening my mind, my doors and window panes, anything with a hinge, everything with a frame until the breeze carries through a new point of reference, truth and you. I want to practice a holy escape, losing track of my minutes that turn into days, because the only time that matters now is time with you and this golden hour. I want to practice release, removing the stones that weigh down my wings, stones of fear, shame, and grief, stones that build walls between you and me. I want to do all of these things, be untamed and wild, open and free, the first to give and the last to hold tight, because gratitude and clenched fists never felt right. And I am starting to see that this life is a river, a holy stream. And if life is a river, then God is the sky touching everything at once and inviting us to try letting go of the raft to float on our backs so that we and God can be eye to eye, a lifetime of baptism and nothing but sky. But first, you have to release. morning. We're live um, here with you, as you can tell. Um, and so I invite you to um, share prayers or praises with us this morning. You can put it in the chat or you can um, text me at 406-647-0383. 
um, text your prayers or praises or leave them in the comments so that we can share them during our time of joys and concerns this morning after the message. Release is a spiritual practice. It is a practice that frees us um, from ourselves and allows us to set other people free. And today, as we reflect on our story, which comes from the Gospel of Matthew, we remember that all of us have personal parts of ourselves, personal things that we need to release, that prevent us from fully living into God's story. And we also remember that as a culture and as a community, we have things that we need to release in order to build the beloved community together more fully and completely. So let's listen. Today's scripture comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. A man approached Jesus and said, Teacher, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? Jesus said, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments. The man said, which ones? Then Jesus said, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. The young man replied, I've, come, I've kept all these. What am I missing? Jesus said, if you want to be complete, go sell what you own and give money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went away saddened because he had many possessions. Let's pray. Gracious God, release our hearts to you. First, we remove the pressure, for release requires the freedom to be moved. Then we allow our hearts to return to their original resting position in sync with you. Then we pray that you will find our hearts available. And so we release our hearts to you, move in them, stir us awake, speak to us now. We are waiting. Amen. This is one of those gospel stories where if you aren't nervously shifting in your seat by the end of it, you haven't really been paying attention. A rich young ruler comes to Jesus with a very specific question about what kind of good deeds he has to do in order to have eternal life. Notice that he didn't ask, what must I do to inherit eternal life, which is a question that other people have asked. He specifically wants to know what good deed do I have to do to have eternal life? He's looking for a straightforward answer, a simple transaction that reflects the economics that govern the rest of his life. If you pay for A, then you get A. If you pay for B, then you get B. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy, transaction complete. 
Instead, of course, Jesus gives him a different answer. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Jesus's answer has five parts to it and the order is important. Go, sell, give, receive, follow. As far as we know, the rich young ruler in the story only got as far as the first one, go. And honestly, same. When I read that story, my first inclination is to skip ahead to that nice thing that Paul says that people read at weddings. What is it about Jesus that time and time again, he asks hard, ridiculous things of me? And here he is again, insisting that I and we take a hard look at our money story. The author and preacher Leah Shade writes that she is often tempted to reverse the Jesus' reply to the rich young ruler. Instead of go, sell, give, receive, follow, she writes that we're tempted to start at the end and work our way back. She says, hey, how about this? I can follow Jesus' prescribed sequence in reverse. One, follow him. Two, get my heaven treasure. Three, give some money to the poor. Four, sell off the things I don't want at a yard sale. Five, go happily on my way, scot-free. When it comes to our faith, we want to follow Jesus first. So it's interesting to me that Jesus puts follow me at the end of this list. Like he's telling us that in order to truly be followers of Jesus, we've got some work to do, some unburdening, some releasing to do. Which, okay, I mean, sure, as the decluttering guru Marie Kondo says in her books and her Netflix shows, we should all get rid of the stuff that doesn't bring us joy. But that's not what Jesus said. And that's not what made the rich young ruler go away grieving. If Jesus had said, take the weekend and declutter and refocus and then catch up with me, we'd all be in line to sign up. What he says is liquidate everything and just walk away. But how do we do that? I'm a woman in my 30s in America. I literally cannot just walk away. The student loan people will find me. The author, Brian McLaren, offers a nuanced interpretation of this story that helps me think about what Jesus might be asking of us. McLaren says, the only way you become a ruler is by working with the Romans. And the only way you become rich is by figuring out how to work the Roman system to your advantage. So this is a guy who is deeply embedded with everything that is wrong with the economy of Jesus' day. What if what Jesus is saying to this guy is this? Listen, you've already made it. You've got a lot of wealth. You're part of a corrupt system and it has worked for you. If you really want to be part of the life of the ages, you understand that obeying the Ten Commandments, that's not enough. You've got to go beyond personal morality, and you've got to be concerned with social morality. Because the kingdom of God doesn't just focus you on worrying about your own moral scorecard. It actually invests you in caring about your neighbor. So stop working for the kingdom of Caesar that's all about climbing to the top and achieving riches, and instead join me in the kingdom of God. Join me in working for the poor. Join me in leveraging your obvious intelligence and gifts and moral rectitude. Invest with me for the sake of the kingdom of God, for the people who are most in need. Switch sides. I think actually, if we take the scripture as a Marie Kondo-like call to clean out our closets because having money or possessions is a sin, or because we have to be perfect in order to follow Jesus, we have really missed the point. And in some ways, 
honestly, I think we've let ourselves off the hook. God doesn't consider us sinful or unworthy because we have things. Joseph of Arimathea, who helped bury Jesus, was both a rich man and a disciple. This isn't a story about being rich, being bad. Like everything in our journey of following Jesus, it's about relationships. Relationships with God, with others, with ourselves. And yes, actually with our stuff, with our money, and even with the ways that our money makes us think about ourselves and think about other people. Maybe especially that last thing. The scholar Douglas R.A. Hare writes that the thing the rich young ruler was most concerned about was not giving more of his money to the poor. He says what he minded was giving up all that wealth means, privilege, status, and economic power. He was not ready to surrender his comfortable and secure world for the unknown, frightening world into which Jesus was calling him. He knew what he was worth in this world. And by those standards, Jesus and his disciples were worth nothing. The rich young ruler had an entire narrative about money that was tied up in worthiness and unworthiness, about what it says about you if you're rich, and probably more so what it says about you if you're poor, about deserving and preserving, about punishing and forgiving. Jesus says to him, you have to let all of that junk go. You can follow me into a new way of living, but you have to release all of that stuff first. And so do we. We live in a world with narratives about rich and poor and debt and poverty and worthy and deserving and unworthy and undeserving. Our narratives cause us to harm others by viewing economic issues like debt and generational poverty as moral choices and personal responsibility. Our narratives cause us to harm ourselves by inflicting shame and fear on ourselves. God stands ready to release us from all of it, but only if we are willing to do it. Last week, we heard this story about how God provided manna to the Israelites who were wandering in the wilderness. We talked about how the economy in Pharaoh's Egypt was one where he and his administration hoarded more and more and more wealth on the backs of the enslaved Israelites until God interrupted the cycle and defeated Pharaoh and led the Israelites through the wilderness. But it didn't take too long for the Israelites to default to the economic model that Pharaoh had forced on them. As time passed, the Israelites forgot about the daily manna model that God had given to them. They started loaning money and charging interest in order to profit off of others among them. And those who couldn't pay their debts or even keep up with the regular payments with interest, they were forced back into slavery. Land was taken from those who fell behind. The cycle of generational poverty started all over again. So God intervened again in a way that most certainly made those who loaned money mad and just as certainly made those who owed money celebrate. The year of Jubilee, the year of the Lord's favor, Every seven years, all debts were forgiven, slaves were freed, land that had been taken away from those in debt was returned to its original owner. God warned the people not to take advantage of this gift, not to do foolish things in the year prior to the Jubilee. But God also said that this was a gift that would release them from the cycle of more, more, more. Now, 
I know it sounds pretty radical. No economist would endorse this. No politician of either party would propose clearing debts every seven years. It is widely, wildly impractical. I'm not an economist or a politician, but I am a pastor. So here's my hot take. The Bible makes it perfectly clear that our first, highest, and most important calling is to love God with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our strength, and with all our minds, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus says that everything, everything else in the Bible, in our relationships, in our lives, rests on this mandate. Everything else in our lives is dependent on this mandate, this rule, this calling. And loving our neighbor as ourselves is not just about being nice to our neighbors. This love that God compels us to show our neighbor, it's not a wishy-washy kind of love. It's not just enough to not be a jerk to our neighbor and call it a day. You cannot love your neighbor while remaining indifferent to their suffering, be it mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, or in this case, economic. Loving your neighbor means not just being nice to your waiter or waitress. It also means advocating for them to earn a livable wage. Loving your neighbor means not just bringing them soup when they get sick. It also means making sure they have health care. Loving your neighbor means not just praying for those facing natural disasters. It also means living in ways that minimize destruction to our planet. Loving your neighbor is a costly endeavor. It is. It isn't easy. It requires commitment. It requires humility. It requires compassion. It requires practice. But the cost of loving our neighbor, the cost of a life in God's kingdom, releases us to other things. Over the last couple of months, as we've lived through lockdowns and reopenings and elections and the aftermath of elections, I felt this need that until I started thinking about the sermon, I couldn't put my finger on. In the book of Deuteronomy, the release of the Jubilee year allows everyone to relax and reset and breathe. We are in desperate need of Jubilee. We have so much we need to release. We need a Jubilee year to end this me versus you rat race and begin again the journey of me with you. What if each of us released ourselves a little bit from the economic and narrative that we've inherited from our culture and moved closer to a money story that looks more like the kingdom of God, more like the economy of grace? What if we allowed ourselves to be released from the fear and the intimidation and the anxiety that our money stories that we've inherited from our culture what they do to us, what they do to others. How might our lives be transformed by that release? How might other lives be transformed by that release? How might it change the way we see ourselves, our value, our worthiness? How might it change the way we see others, their value? their worthiness. Today and through this week, I invite you to consider the story you've inherited and the story that Jesus offers to you. May you find in the invitation the beginning of release. May it take hold of your imagination. May it lead you toward newness. Let us join together in celebrating and affirming 
the faith of a God who calls us toward love, grace, and release. We believe that on the first day, God released love and creativity over a void, and that void became mountains and rivers, sunsets and starry nights. We believe God released God's people from the grips of slavery, liberating us day in and day out. We believe God laid down with death and was released from its grip, knowing suffering and freeing us from this fragile life. And we believe God invites us day in and day out to release our fears, let go of assumptions, tear down walls, throw open the doors, and walk closer to love. May it be so. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. And um, we've been, in this time, we will share our joys and concerns together. Um, Prayers from Shirley Collins, uh, prayers for her granddaughter Jessica and Jessica's husband Josh, and prayers also for Jessica's father-in-law Jeff. She, Shirley also asked prayers for her mom Marion Andrew, who's also part of our church. Marion is at St. John's, and um, her unit had to go on lockdown again this week, which is just really hard. So. Um, Prayers for Marion and for um, all of the folks at St. John's and all of the folks who are um, living in facilities and having to deal with those that close um, connection. Last week in our worship pods, uh, Cheryl Swanson also asked for prayers for um, her friend Jill and for all of those people who are at the prison, at the women's prison and the men's prison here in Montana and around the country as they also um, try to deal with COVID and keeping um, people as safe as possible. So prayers for, um, for all those in prison and um, that we can continue to monitor and keep each other safe. Um, my husband Jerry asked for prayers for a coworker of his who, um, whose husband passed away from COVID this week. Um, I know, this weekend, I know all of us are feeling the fatigue and the kind of strain that this, um, this time in our lives presents to us. And so, um, let us hold each other in prayer. Let us, um, hold our neighbors in prayer and continue to, um, to do the hard work of keeping one another safe in this time. Prayers for the kids, the students, the teachers, and the parents at our schools. Um, prayers uh, for, we just learned that Alex Trebek passed away. So prayers for his family and for all of the people um, who love him around the world. This last week, as you know, we had an election. Um, I guess it's been going on for like 40 or 45 years. Um, and finally, this, this week, um, we finally got to vote. Thank you to everybody who voted. Um, and so I would just ask for prayers for our country as we live in the, in the aftermath of this election and as we um, hopefully can begin to find ways to be together, to listen to one another and talk to each other, um, and um, that we can treat each other extra kindly um, in the next couple of weeks as we, as we continue to, I think, heal a little bit from all of the divisions that we've experienced during this election time. Thank you for sharing your prayers and your praises. If um, you have more that you would like to share, um, please continue to put them in the in the chat. I'm just gonna check and see if any if there are any others before we. Um... Oh, prayers for Kate Sith and her family. I hope I got her name right. 
um, from Brad. Any other prayers, um, please continue to share them in the chat or um, you can text them to me at 406-647-0383. Now let us be in the spirit of prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now is the time that we offer our gifts and our lives to God. There are several ways that you can give to Grace. You can go online to graceumcbillings.org slash give. You can um, text the amount of your gift to 406-660-3699. Or you can send a check um, into the church. That works just as well. Um, the address is 1935 Avenue B, Billings, Montana, 59102. Thank you for all of the ways that you give to Grace, the ways that you show up for each other, for the church, for the community. Um, thank you for the prayers that you share, for um, all that you do um, for our church and for our community. Um, we are so grateful for the ways that you help us and the Ministry of Grace to grow in God's grace and build beloved community in Billings and beyond. Um, so will you join me in the prayer of commitment?
So, um, thank you for joining us for worship today. I want to thank Scott and Tammy, who are our tech crew here with me this morning. Um, and um, I'm so glad that you joined us for worship. Before we go, a couple of announcements. We will be having our annual Church Charge Conference, which is our the um, time of the year where we um, reflect on the year that has been, what a year it has been, and we look forward um, to what is coming up for the next year at Grace, and we also make some important decisions about our life as a church community together. So I invite you to join us. Um, church conference will be on November 22nd, which is a Sunday, not next Sunday, but the Sunday after. Um, and it's going to be in the afternoon this time, usually it's in the evening. So it's November 22nd from 2.30 to 4.30, and it will be on Zoom. Now, I know for some people Zoom is not the easiest thing to navigate. So we're going to have an option for uh, a maximum of 12 people. If you would like to um, attend in person and watch, kind of have somebody else navigate Zoom for you, we're going to meet here at the church in the Fellowship Hall. And so um, you are invited if you'd like. It's kind of first come, first serve. We have 12 spots. So um, you can call the office um, if you'd like to be put on the list of people who will attend church conference in person. Um, look for more information about it. We'll be sending out an email on Monday, and we will also be sending it in the regular email that comes out on Friday. So check those to get the link and the details about church conference. Um, we are, last week we started our worship pods. Who Worship pods are our kind of in-person way of, of worshiping together. And there's still room for uh, more people. If you would like to be part of a worship pod, go online to graceumcbillings.org slash community worship, or you can call into the office and um, we will put you on the list and you can sign up for a time. It's, um, it's a wonderful experience of church and being together. It's a little different, but it's still wonderful. So if you would like to be part of a worship pod, please sign up. Um, so along with our Money Story series, we are going to be doing um, a couple of weeks of a small group where we'll be um, talking about our own money stories, reflecting on our own money stories, and reflecting on the larger money story that God gives us as we're doing in worship. But this will be a, a, a chance for us to really kind of dig into our own personal stories. So I invite you to join us. That's going to be on Zoom this Wednesday and next Wednesday from 6 to 7. Um, if you would like the link, you'll find it in the email that we sent last Friday. Um, so please check that and make sure if you are, if you don't get our emails, you can also put an information in the chat or send us a message through Facebook. That's all the announcements. Um, so, friends, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the power of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you wherever it is you find yourself. Go to serve God and others in all that you do. Wash your hands. Wear a mask. Love your neighbor. Go in peace.